truth. Now, I am, and I hear Terry back there, I am an amener in church. <laughs> I am, I'm a clapper in church. I, I, I do all kinds of things. I, I love to sing. Tonight, what we're going to ask, I don't know, I know that some of you, this is going to be a real discipline. Um, but we're going to ask that after we get started, after I introduce both um, people debating, um, I'm going to, we'll, we'll clap for them, and then we won't clap, amen, cheer, grunt, throw our fists in the air, throw tomatoes, throw anything, um, until the, till it's over, till we're done with the question time. <laughs> oh, so, <laughs> now you, you can, uh, what I do encourage you to do is I have um, note cards, and we're going to use these for two, in two ways. We'd like, if possible, for you to, at the end of the debate, to share if this has impacted you towards one way or the other. we just like to know that. We'd like to be able to show that this had a meaning empirically. Secondly, we'd also like, we do not, we're not going to have an open mic question time. I know some of you are disappointed about that. But what we will have is we'll give you an opportunity to write your question down. And then Randy and I will read the questions that we're, we select to the various debaters. I know that that's disappointing. Some of you really like the mic. But that's, that's how we're going to go. And what, what the format of our debate tonight is this. The affirmative answer to the question will have a 12-minute opening statement. And then the negative opening statement will be 12 minutes. Then it goes back and forth. Affirmative rebuttal for six minutes. Negative rebuttal for six minutes. Affirmative rebuttal for a second time, four minutes. And then a conclusion of six minutes each. Does that, that, that confer with what you all have? All right. Make sure we have that in place. Let me introduce our – so it goes six minutes, uh, 12, 6, 4, 6. We slightly changed it up at the last email conversation. 12, 6. We took out um, – here's a copy of mine. If you want to take a look at that real quick. I'll introduce Steve while he's reading that. And uh, this is Dr. Steve Sukalis, who teaches uh, apologetics and Christian thought at Wesley Biblical Seminary. We're thankful to have Wesley Biblical Seminary here. They have a booth set up, and some of Steve's nine books and several scholarly articles are back, available for purchase. We'd encourage you to take a look at those. Um, Steve received an MDiv from Gordon Conwell, um, uh, I guess, uh, Gordon Conwell Theological, and then also a THM from Harvard, and then he has his PhD from the University of Birmingham. Not Birmingham in Alabama, but Birmingham in England. Um, so he is, he, his wife is Dr. Sandy Richter, who is an Old Testament professor, and he has two daughters, and their names are Noel and Elise. So he's a proud father there. We're also glad to have Dr. Zachary Moore, who is the coordinator of the DFW Coalition for Reason. Is that the best way? Co of reason. Of reason. Coalition of reason. DFW Core. And he has a PhD from the University of Cincinnati in molecular biology. So now is the chance you get to clap. So let's clap for our debaters. <laughs> How it's going to work with reference to time is um, Randy is going to be the timekeeper. And he'll say start. And that will be the beginning. And Steve, as the affirmative answer, will give the first response, and then we'll go to Zach. And I'll be moderating bet between, and we'll just make sure that we keep things together. Now, I want to hand out these cards, and I have some pens, too. Could I appoint somebody to take? Terry, could you do that task? So if you'd like to um, write a question down, maybe it comes to you in the middle of the time. And here's some pens. Yeah. Write as legibly as you can. And I also want to say hello to many friends who I know are watching online. Uh, we have many people who are interested in this, and we sent the link to both groups. And we welcome you to the Salvation Army of Arlington. And we'll get started here, and Randy will give us that start.
It's great to be here. Welcome and thank you. A few preliminaries are in order. First, with a comparative study of religion, which is my field of expertise, along with, for example, science and philology, it is, as Mortimer J. Adler states in his book, Ten Philosophical Mistakes, a body of knowledge resulting from scholarly research. Adler goes on to state that if these bodies of knowledge, and again, this includes the comparative study of religion, rely upon methodological investigation, they belong with the empirical sciences. Adler then rightly points out that, quote, the other question to be decided is whether or not they are knowledge of reality. In debating the case between faith as concerns biblical Christianity as the uniquely true religion in the universe and faith displayed by atheists, ontological and epistemological issues rise to the fore. Simply put, ontology involves what is true. Epistemology concerns the question, how does one come to know what one knows? Involved in the quest for ontology and within the discipline that concerns epistemology, one develops a worldview. Simply defined, a worldview involves a person's thoughts and statements about the cosmos and that person's place in it. In addition to answering the questions of life in a way that is logical, in part, a worldview must be both livable and coherent. Here, one mu must ask questions like, does the worldview correspond to what is, in reality, thus ontologically, the case? Is the worldview coherent? In other words, does it logically and consistently cohere, stay together when put to the test? Can a person and does a person live by the worldview? Answers to these questions uh, bring up issues such as what is and what ought or what ought not be done. All this said, I come to the matters of epistemology. How I come to know what I know. This involves several definitions which may, many flow from the first few, which are soft foundationalism. As I define it and embrace it, soft foundationalism as a form of epistemic justification holds that there are certain foundational truth conducive grounds that can be applied and rationally accepted as means of providing warrant for one's beliefs. Following are certain foundational truth conducive grounds. Incorrigibility. Incorrigibility means something that is impossible to change or very difficult to change. An incorrigible belief is that which the opposite is impossible to think of or comprehend. Properly basic. This follows quite closely to incorrigibility. Properly basic means that which is self-evident. Examples of self-evident phenomena are perception. We all, if we are functioning properly in our environment, perceive. And it is impossible to perceive that we do not perceive. Reason. We all have, again, if functioning properly in our environment, reasoning capacities, and it is impossible to reason that we do not reason. In the moral sense, perception and reason are ways in which we are able to distinguish between awful acts such as rape and murder, rather than call them simply sex for the propagation of our species or taking one's life for food. With incorrigibility and properly basic covered, we now move to other epistemological ingredients that will answer the question, how does Sukalis come to know what he knows? Truth. Truth is that which corresponds to what in reality is the case. The correspondence theory of truth. Simply put, and to glean from J.P. Moreland, the correspondence theory of truth purports that a proposition is true if and only if it corresponds to reality, when what it asserts to be the case is the case. Let's say then that in an email I make this proposition to students in one of my online classes. Dear students, added to your resource listing uh, is the revised syllabus, which includes my new home phone number, in good Hollywood fashion, 555-1366. Now, this proposition asserts this to be the case. The next step is for students to see if my proposition corresponds with reality, to see if what I have asserted is indeed the case. So. Employing the correspondence theory of truth, students go online, click the resources tab, click on course syllabus, and see the new phone number. Thus, what I asserted to be the case is the case. Absolute or obje objective truth. Absolute or objective truth is that which is universally true. The truth is true independent of one's knowing it, acknowledging it, or affirming it as true. 
In other words, it does not take my acknowledgement of something or some truth proposition in order for it to be true. It simply is true. It is true regardless of whether or not I know it or acknowledge it or affirm it as true. For example, my assertion that my new phone number appears in the revised syllabus was in reality true regardless of students verifying it as true. In other words, the proposition was true whether or not we saw that it was true. For in reality, the new phone number was there and it did not require confirmation for it to be the case in actuality. Truth proposition. A truth proposition asserts something to be the case. My email to the students included a truth proposition. With the correspondence theory of truth, I mentioned truth conducive grounds. Another truth conducive ground is the witness of history which involves the further truth conducive grounds of verbal and written testimony. The number of eyewitnesses in relation to a historical truth, proposition, or claim or recorded event. And the later string of witnesses to the claim who were not there at the time of the event, event but who in various ways provided a historical link to the original claim or recording of the event. Additionally, related to these are the disciplines of archaeology and text critical studies. All this said, I announced the truth proposition. Biblical Christianity is the uniquely true religion. To demonstrate this, I first need to demonstrate beyond reasonable doubt that the Bible is uniquely and reliable God's, God's communication of himself to humanity in space and time. I shall proceed to give warrant for my truth proposition as a lawyer does in a courtroom with the practice of cumulative case argumentation. Let's now reason together and consider the evidence. The Bible is a reliable historical collection of books, historically accurate, meticulously preserved, and archaeologically verified. Employing the correspondence theory of truth, when examining the various copies of manuscripts of the New Testament for margin of disagreement between all of them, we find an extremely high percentage of agreement between the existing manuscript copies, more so than any other work of antiquity. Second, there is no conclusive evidence that discredits the Bible's historical assertions. Third, thousands of archaeological finds support the Bible's record of, uh, record of events. For this, see, for example, F.F. F. Bruce, the New Testament documents. Are they reliable? Due to time restraint, I will expound upon one of these. Consider the historical records for the historicity of Jesus of Nazareth. First, we have a holy book, scholars date to the first century A.D., that claims the existence of Jesus. For example, in the New Testament, we have a fragment of the copy of the Gospel of John dating to about 130 A.D. And thousands upon thousands of Greek copies of the New Testament containing eyewitness accounts that correspond to extra-biblical historical records. More on that in a moment. By the end of the second century A.D., we have the Moratorium fragment, which contains a list of New Testament books in circulation at that time. The Gospels of Matthew and Mark the Gospels of Luke and John, Paul's nine letters to churches, and an additional four of his to Philemon, Titus, and Timothy. We have Jude, two epistles of John, and the Revelation. This, in part, led the great textual critic Bruce Metzger to state, quote, what is really remarkable is that though the, the fringes of the New Testament canon remained unsettled for centuries, a high degree of unanimity concerning the greater part of the New Testament was attained within the first two centuries among the very diverse and scattered congregations, not only throughout the Mediterranean world, but also over an area existing throughout from Britain to Mesopotamia. Startling in this statement is not only the information that most of the New Testament books were accepted and circulated by the end of the second century AD, but the geographical extent to which they were circulated. And please note, these texts explicitly mention Jesus of Nazareth in space and time. Most importantly for our purpose, actual non-biblical historians testified that Jesus of Nazareth existed. We have the witness of the first century AD Jewish historian Josephus and the first century AD born Roman historian Tacitus both mentioning Jesus during and slightly after the time of the New Testament was right, written. F.F. F. Bruce points out that, quote, in the pages of Josephus, we meet many figures who are well known to us from the New Testament. The colorful family of the Herods, the Roman emperors Augustus, Tiberius, Claudius, and Nero, Quirinius, the governor of Syria, Pilate, Felix, and Festus. Josephus mentions the death of John the Baptist at the hands of Herod. 
Josephus mentions Jesus, the so-called Christ. And in another place, Jesus, uh, Josephus writes of Jesus, a wise man, if indeed we should call him a man, for he was a doer of marvelous deeds. This man was the Christ. And when Pilate had condemned him to the cross, he appeared to them on the third day alive again. Even now, the tribe of Christians so named after him has not yet died out. Tacitus, the Roman historian in the very early part of the second century AD, recalls a crowd, quote, called Christians, and that, quote, Christus, from whom they got their name, had been executed by sentence of the procurator Pontius Pilate, Pilate when Tiberius was emperor. Pliny the Younger, governor, governor of Bithynia in Asia Minor, in his letter to Emperor Trajan, mentions Christians who, quote, were in the habit of meeting on a certain day when they sang an anthem to Christ as God. This is only a very small sampling of evidence. One serious question, however, remains as regards Jesus of Nazareth. Sure, he may be a historical figure, but what of the claim that Jesus, as God the Son, is a historical figure? It is here that my foundationalist epistemology will continue in cumulative case fashion in my next argument. Yes. All right. Well, I'd like to thank the Salvation Army uh, for inviting me out today um, to tell you all that uh, all your most deeply held and most cherished beliefs are false. Um, it's, a, it's a real honor to, to be invited to come out and do that with you guys. Um, Mark Twain said, um, it's not the parts of the Bible that he doesn't understand that gives him problems. It's the, part that he, it's the parts that he do, does understand. And that's kind of um, where I've come to also. You know, I, I don't really come to you today so much as an atheist, although I am a card-carrying atheist these days. Uh, I come to you primarily as a lover of the Bible. Um, I was raised as a Christian and, and read the Bible cover to cover many, many times. Um, I, I certainly don't have the credentials that Dr. Zuclus has, but, um, but I hope I can at least impress upon you a little bit of my, my enthusiasm for this work and um, my particular embarrassment on behalf of this book. Um, you know, just in kind of the same way that it's a little embarrassing for me to share the stage with Dr. Suklas. I mean, although I do have a PhD, I, I in no way am a professional in regards to this book. Um, it's, it's also a little embarrassing um, for people to regard this book and, and place it on a pedestal and treat it as divine communication when that is really not what it is. This is really just a work of human literature. And uh, it, because I love this book so much, even though it is a human book, it, it's, a, it's embarrassing for me on behalf of the Bible to, to hear people talk about it in such glowing terms and to place so much emphasis on what it says uh, in, in, for their lives. Um, so. In regards to the, the two organizations here that I'm, I'm uh, speaking with, so I actually looked at the, the position statements for the Salvation Army and for uh, the Wesley Biblical Seminary. And the, the Salvation Army position statement about the Bible says that it is the inspiration of God. Um, and it's the only thing that constitutes the divine rule of Christian faith and practice. Wesley Bi Biblical Seminary also says that this is divinely inspired um, without error uh, without, death, without defect, um, infallible, in fact, um, and that its full inspiration, absolute trustworthiness um, should be used by, by all Christians. So uh, when I come to consider the proposition, is biblical Christianity unique and true, I think what I kind of have to talk about is the Bible, and it's really the only thing that I can talk about intelligently here um, as an amateur. So, um, so I really have two questions that I'll, I'll be exploring here. Number one, is the Bible unique? And number, number two is the Bible true. Um, so let's start at the very beginning, won't we? Uh, in Genesis 1, I, I think we're all pretty much familiar with the Genesis account and, and how it proceeds. What you may not be familiar with is something called the Enuma Elish, uh, which is another creation account from the Sumerian tradition uh, through Babylon. Uh, the Enuma Elish kind of goes like this. When on heaven, when on high, the heaven had not been named, firm ground below had been called by name, when primordial Apsu, their begetter, and Mumutiamat, she who bore them all, their waters mingled as a single body. No reed hut had sprung forth, no marshland had appeared, none of the gods had been brought into being, and none bore a name, no destinies determined. Then it was that the gods were formed in the midst of heaven. Lamu and Lamahum were brought forth, by name they were called. 
what you have here starting off in the Sumerian tradition is almost exactly the same thing you see at Genesis 1. You have the waters intermingling. Apsu and Tiamat represent the salt and the fresh water respectively, and they mingle together in the chaos and in the void of the preformed world. Just like we see in, in Genesis 1, the, the world was void and without form, and the spirit rose above the waters, very similar to what we see in the Enuma Elish. The other thing that we see that's, um, that is reminiscent of Genesis 1 is a, a, a clear and orderly progression of different layers of creation. So in, in Genesis 1, we have different things being created on different days. In the Enuma Elish, we have different gods being created a, a, in different progressions that represent different things. So the first you have, of course, the waters, Apsu and Tima, fresh and salt water. Then you have uh, Lamu and Lahamu, mud and silt. Then you have Anshar and Kishar, the gods of heavens and the earth, right? So you have the waters, and then you split them, and you have the firmament and the heavens. Uh, then you have Enlil, who is the god of plants and agriculture, just like in Genesis 1. You have Anu, the god of the stars and the heavens. You have Nana, the god of the moon, right? Just like in Genesis 1, the stars and the moon. Then you have Enki, who is the creator of man, along with Marduk, who in fact um, is the defeater of Tiamat. He actually kills the, the one of the first gods. Um, why don't I mention Marduk? Um, we see that same motif of, of the, the younger gods struggling with the older gods, the primordial gods, the, the, the chaos, the water dragon that represents the, the chaotic ocean. We see that in the Sumerian myth cycle with Marduk and Tiamat. We also see that in the Ugaritic cycle with Baal. Has anybody ever heard of Baal? He figures pretty prominently in the Bible. Um, the Baal Hadad, actually, was his full name, is the, pretty much the same thing as Marduk in the Ugaritic myth cycle. And instead of fighting Tiamat, he fights a different chaos dragon called Lotan. And in the Hebrew myth cycle, we have Yahweh. Everybody heard of Yahweh? That's the actual name of, of God in the Hebrew myth cycle. He fights Leviathan, the chaos dragon. Has anybody heard of that story? Yahweh and the chaos dragon, no? Well, you haven't been reading your Bible well enough. If you turn to Psalm 74, you read uh, the psalmist talking about Yahweh. He says, by your power, you split the sea in two and smash the heads of the monsters on the waters. You crush Leviathan's heads, gave him as food to the wild animals. You release the springs and brooks and turn primordial rivers into dry land. You also see the same reference in Isaiah 27. Yahweh will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, the coiling serpent. He'll kill the dragon that lives in the sea. So a very clear uh, uh, similarity to the Sumerian and Ugaritic myths. You also see, uh, everybody's familiar with the flood story. Um, has anybody read the Epic of Gilgamesh, written in uh, about 2000 BC? Right, so in the Epic of Gilgamesh, Gil Gilgamesh um, comes to a man named Utnapishtim. Well, Utnapishtim is basically the Sumerian Noah. He was approached by Enki, who sort of stands in for Yahweh, and he's told that the gods are conspiring to kill man. He's told to build a boat to save all of his possessions and his belongings. He does so. Um, it rains for six days and seven nights. Everything is flooded. His boat gets lodged on the top of a mountain. Does that sound familiar? Um, Yotnapishtim sends out a dove that comes back. He sends out a swallow that comes back. He sends out a raven that doesn't come back. And then he releases his animals out. And uh, then Yotnapishtim offers an animal sacrifice to the gods. And they smelled it. And, the, and they smelled the pleasing smell, just like Yahweh smells the pleasing smell of Noah's sacrifice after the flood story. Um, another uh, Sumerian flood myth has to do with Zasudra, another individual who's just like Noah. So again, we're not dealing with unique stories here. Um, and let's not stick to the Old Testament. Let's look at the, uh, the New Testament. The stories told about Jesus in the Gospels are not unique. They are very similar to other stories told about other individuals, other literary figures and other characters at about the same time. So Jesus, we know Jesus to be a miracle worker. Well, you know who else was a miracle worker? Rabbi Hanina Bendoza, who was told about in the Babylonian Talmud. Um, he miraculously, miraculously killed a venomous snake by stepping on it, and it tried to bite him, but it did not kill him. Does that sound familiar? Um, Asclepius, the Greek god of healing, uh, people would go to him and pray to him, and he would actually uh, heal them. Um, Apollonius of Tyana, um, who was written about by Philostratus, may have been, um, actually been a, a historical person, um, saves a crowd of people um, from, a, from a demon who uh, sort of appears at them, and he, uh, he saves them by uh, um, having everybody throw rocks at them. He also, uh, in a story that's very similar to Jesus um, saving the young girl who appears to have died, there's a, a young girl uh, in a story told about Apollonius who has uh, appeared to have died, and Apollonius comes to her and raises her from the dead on her wedding day, in fact. So these miracle worker stories are not unique to the Bible. They're not unique to Jesus. 
Um, we also see, um, if you're familiar with uh, the cynics and cynic philosophy, many of the cynic sayings are very similar to what we hear Jesus saying in the Gospels. Seek and ye shall find. That's something that Jesus said, right? Well, it's also something that the cynics were saying at about the same time. Uh, Blessed are the poor, for there the, is the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus said. The cynics said, only the person who's despised wealth is worthy of the kingdom of God. Um, so all this cynic philosophy floating around at exactly the same time that Jesus is supposed to have lived um, is, you know, again, this just indicates that this is not unique. And finally, Jesus as a dying God-man. There are a number of uh, supernatural figures in the ancient world that died and then were resurrected back to life. Osiris being one of the most oldest ones, uh, if you're familiar with the story of Osiris, um, the, the other gods conspired against him, killed him, his, his body was cut up, and his wife found him, put him back together. He was resurrected from the dead, and he actually went to the afterlife and where he sits in judgment of, of people after they die. Does that sound like anybody familiar? Um, we see similar, um, a similar motif in the life of Dionysus, who was a Greek god who lived at about the same time, or who uh, was, was worshipped at about the same time in a mystery cult. Um, Dionysus worship actually had a particular um, ritual that people would uh, would partake in. They would eat bread and drink wine. The wine was the was the the blood of Dionysus, right? Dionysus is the god of wine. His blood is wine. Does that sound like anybody familiar? Um, and Lord Raglan, in fact, um, created a a hero motif, a, a marker system where he compared the lives of different heroes, heroic figures throughout history. He started with Theseus, and he compared all these other heroes in, in all the different myths. And Theseus got a full 21 points because that's he had the most heroic things about him. And if you compared his life with the lives of all these other characters, you could sort of see where they stacked up. Well, Jesus actually gets 17 out of 21 from this hero motif, from this literary motif. Jesus appears to be a literary character uh, as much as he is a historical character. Um, I'll uh, I'll go ahead and stop there. If I said um, you have one minute left, is that helpful? Okay. But right. <laughs> <laughs> We're allowed to laugh. That's good too. Okay. Frost the flakes have the taste that adults have grown to love. Very great. Okay. That doesn't mean I'm right though. <laughs> <laughs> and begin. I mentioned uh, the question now is: Is Jesus of Nazareth as God the Son in a historical figure? First, we have, according to F.F. F. Bruce, a historically reliable book, the New Testament. So historical is it that he wrote, quote, the evidence for our New Testament writings is ever so much greater than the evidence for many writings of classical authors, the authenticity of which no one dreams of questioning. And if the New Testament were a collection of secular writings, their authenticity would generally be regarded as beyond all doubt. Second, with this evidence in front of us, we come face to face, face with uh, thousands of largely in agreement early copies of the New Testament and how they, by virtue of eyewitnesses themselves and Jesus' testimony himself, of himself, testify to Jesus of Nazareth as God the Son, he being the only way to salvation and to his resurrection from the dead, which in part was eyewitnessed by over 500 people at once. Third. We have a long string of later historical witnesses, the early church theologians, who describe Jesus as God. If Ignatius is correctly dated to around 110 AD, his testimony to Jesus as God the Son is so close to the death of, the John, of John the Apostle that it would be foolish to think that there was not continuity between the New Testament witness to Jesus as God and the beliefs of the earliest Christians, which beliefs include his bodily resurrection from the dead. But even if Ignatius' writings are dated too excitedly, certainly we have in the mid to late second century AD the witness of Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Tertullian, and that Jesus of Nazareth is God the Son raised from the dead. Fourth, in this reliable book so confirmed by such evidence, we find in it the teaching that God the Holy Spirit actually has been at work throughout this whole epistemic process from before the beginning to, uh, to, the, uh, before the, beginning, to the beginning to the end. 
the external and internal witness of the Holy Spirit then moves me from viewing Christian theism as uniquely true beyond a reasonable doubt to absolute certainty that Christian the uh, theism is uniquely true. This brings me to the final portion of my affirmation before I respond uh, briefly to some comments made by Zach. With the empirical science of comparative study of religion and narrow narrowing it down even further to empirical science relating to demonstration of the veracity of uh, Christian theism, biblical, what is the case now can be stated. The triune God is the only true God in part due to Jesus of Nazareth, who is God the Son, revealing, exegeting, the Father. Jesus does this uniquely as he claimed and as the writers of the Bible claim. The triune God is therefore the fount of truth and morality for he is holy, righteous, good and just. This ontology that describes then has to be tied in a warranted way to what is prescribed. That is what ought to and what ought not be done by individuals. And on this we have the Ten Commandments. These, now please listen to me carefully. These prescriptions from God flow out of his very being. This is the ontological ground for Christians' morality. In con uh, contrast, this contrast this with materialistic atheism, which ultimately has no ontological basis for a standardized universal morality. It cannot, and this I will probe later. Friends, the biblical Jesus can be accepted the biblical Jesus can be rejected, but the biblical Jesus cannot be reasonably ignored by the grace of the tr eternal triune God, who is truth, I respectfully and lovingly call atheists to repentance, through acknowledgement of the historical Jesus as uniquely God the Son, who was raised from the dead, and to live a life consistent with the Christian worldview by his grace. Some points by Zachary May committed a logical fallacy, and it is this. Similarity does not necessarily prove that the Bible is wrong. That is just logically incoherent. Similarity, another logical option to this, is that the similarities between Jesus and other savior figures, Enuma Elish and the Genesis 1 account, another logical option is one of them's right. And that's for what I gave evidence. So please remember that Dr. Moore has not provided a defeater when it comes to the veracity of the Bible. Uh, a couple other things. There are wonderful scholars. I, one was my colleague, Dr. John Oswald, wrote a commentary on Isaiah. Yet also Dr. John Oswald's book concerning myths, creation myths, and the Bible. My wife, Dr. Sandy, Rick, Sandy Richter, PhD, Harvard University in Hebrew Bible, ancient Near, Ang ancient Near Eastern languages and civilizations, points out that the Genesis 1 account is actually an apologetic against Enuma Elish. An apologetic. Read widely. Dr. Moore has respectively, respectfully admitted that he's not a biblical scholar. I am, and I'm also a Christian apologist. He is wandering outside of his domain of expertise. Okay, uh, yes, it is true that uh, demonstrating a similarity does not necessarily prove that the Bible is wrong, but it does show that it is not unique, which is what I was trying to do, and that's part of the uh, um, uh, assess or, uh, assertion here that we're talking about. Um, it's interesting he brings up his wife's um, uh, regarding the Enuma Elish being an ap apologetic against, or Genesis 1 being an apologetic against uh, Genesis 1. I actually, I'm not an expert, but I had read that, that some uh, people do think that. The one interesting thing about that apologetic argument is that it doesn't really work unless they are really, really similar, which was kind of the point I was making anyway. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I, I was talking about the uniqueness of the Bible. Now let's talk about its being true. And uh, one of the things that um, is really, really interesting is when we go and look at uh, the Ten Commandments, as Dr. Suklas mentioned. Um, so how many people know that there's actually two versions of the Ten Commandments? 
Okay, Exodus 20 and Exodus 34. You can look this up. I'm not, I'm not making this up. Exodus 20, Exodus 34. The, the one in 34 comes after the first version has been smashed, right? Everybody knows that. The first version was, was smashed. Moses went up and wrote another version. If you read what that version says in Exodus 34, it is very different, very different from the version in Exodus 20. In Exodus 20 reads like this. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make idols. You shall not misuse the name Yahweh. Remember the Sabbath. Honor your father and mother. Do not kill. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not lie. Do not covet. Right? That's the version that was smashed. The version that Moses rewrote in Exodus 34 says, Num, one, number one, you shall have no other gods. Number two, shall, you shall not make idols. Okay, we're still on the same page. Number three, you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. That's the third commandment. Number four, you shall give your firstborn to Yahweh. Number five, remember the Sabbath. Okay, we're kind of on track. But then again, we're supposed to observe the Feast of Weeks, number six. Number seven, you shall serve Yahweh tw thrice yearly. Uh, I'm sorry, that's six. Number seven, you shall not mix the sacrificial blood with the bread. I guess that's important. Uh, number nine, you shall bring your first fruits of everything that you produce to Yahweh. And number ten, you shall not boil a kid in its mother's milk. That is the second version of the Ten Commandments. We know it's the second version of the Ten Commandments because that's the only place in the Bible text where it says this is the Ten Commandments. It doesn't actually say that in Exodus 20. We all assume it does. It only actually says that in Exodus 30, 34, and you can look that up for yourself. So again, if this Bible is, is written by the, this perfect creator uh, deity, and there seems to be a significant mistake there. Um, Dr. Suklas also mentioned uh, Justin Martyr. Justin Martyr actually agreed with me. Uh, he was one of the first Christian apologists. He agreed the, to the fact that Jesus was so very similar to these other dying and rising Godmen. This is what he wrote in his first apology. He says, and when we say that as Christians, also that the word, Jesus, who is the first birth of God, was produced without sexual union, and that he, Jesus Christ, our teacher, was crucified and died and rose again and ascended into heaven, we propound nothing different from what you believe regarding those who you esteem sons of Jupiter. So Justin Martyr is saying, yeah, Jesus and these other godmen, they're pretty similar, but, you know, whatever. Now, why do you think that would be the case? Well, Justin Martyr actually gives a reason for that, and believe it or not, this reason is still given by some Christian apologists today. I don't know if Dr. Suklas agrees with this, but Justin Martyr said, basically, that the reason why all these other godmen look so much similar to Jesus is because the devil read the Hebrew scriptures ahead of time, figured out who, who Jesus was going to be and what he was going to do, and tricked all these other humans for thousands of years into worshiping God-men that were exactly like Jesus. He writes it there in his first apology. You can go read that for yourself. Um, and uh, C.S. Lewis basically agreed with this. Ba C.S. Lewis um, was a, a literary guy, and he wrote you know, many great stories, uh, The Lion, the Witch, The Wardrobe, all the Narnia series. Um, those are some of my favorites. C.S. Lewis admitted that this story of Jesus, yes, it's a myth, but it's a true myth. Okay, well, we're, we're still deal dealing with whether or not this is unique. Clearly, if this is just like all these other myths, then we're not dealing with something that's unique. Um, got a few other minutes. Um, let's talk about um, Yahweh as this infinitely perfect being and the source of all of our morality. If you read in Numbers 31, you read something that should turn your stomach. Um, if you're a, a normal, moral person, you read that Moses authorized the Hebrew people to kill all of the Midianite people that they conquered, except for the young girls who had not, not yet known men, but it basically were the virgin girls. That they were to take them for themselves, and that each one of the Hebrew men were to, to get basically a certain number of these Midianite girls to do with whatever they wanted, and the priests each got seven um, of themselves. Now, is th does this sound like it's, it's coming from the source of all that is good in the world, all the, the source of all morality? Um, in fact, in, uh, in Isaiah 45, um, Yahweh actually takes credit for, for being the source of all the evil. If you look up 45, verse 7, he says, I am Yahweh, and there is no other. I form the light, and I create the darkness. I make uh, good, and I create evil. I, Yahweh, do these things. Um, and, uh, well, we'll just cap it off with the book of Job. If you read the book of Job, you're, you're reading about a man who has been treated very poorly by God and wants to know why. If you read the very last chapter of the book of Job, you'll see that Yahweh comes to give an explanation and gives no explanation. Basically says, I'm Yahweh, I can do whatever I want. That is not a moral God. So we have a, a four minute rebuttal. Uh, we'll get to some of these, hopefully. <laughs> I don't know if I will. I've, I've got a rebuttal here. Four minutes. It is compelling that Dr. Moore lost the debate 
when he showed up tonight. I shall explain. In a past lecture, Dr. Moore stated, in evolution, you talk about, well, organism X evolved some characteristic Y, and it makes it sound like there is an intention there. This organism wanted to change and wanted to do these different things, but it evolved this particular characteristic. And of course, anyone who's familiar with natural selection knows that that's not how it works. Genetic evolution would be regarded as teleonomic. It is law-like, but it does not seek any particular goal. It proceeds according to its manner. He further stated, there's a lot of criticism to the random chance aspect of evolution. Everything just amounts to chance. People have a real need to find a purpose in reality. This usually de derives from some sort of a religious conviction. But other philosophical views hold this too. Speaking of creationists, they have a hard time accepting the view that reality doesn't care. They really need to have this conception that there is really a purpose. Evolutionary theory obviously undermines this because it shows that this is not necessarily the case. Quote from Dr. Moore, we have to create our own meaning. This is not coming from an evolutionist, it's just personally. But yeah, in a cosmic sense, evolution does not give any sort of meaning. A question to Dr. Moore was then posed. Where do you get your moral code? Dr. Moore's answer. I create my own moral code based on, my, on, on observations. I try to be as scientific as possible without, about what I derive my morality from. A comment was then made by the questioner regarding a statement made by the murderer Jeffrey Dahmer, to which Dr. Moore replied, I have no idea about Jeffrey Dahmer. I don't know what he did. I doubt that he was being sincere in what he was saying. Dr. Moore lost the debate when he showed up because he has no universally warranted reason for debating. As Richard Dawkins stated in, uh, quote, DNA neither cares nor knows. DNA just is, and we dance to its music. I shall now repeat portions of Dr. Moore's statement above and respond. First is the common, genetic evolution is law-like, but it does not seek any particular goal. It proceeds according to its manner. First, ultimately, this debate should therefore mean nothing to Dr. Moore. Second, in response to the question, where do you get your moral code, he asserted, I create my mo own moral code based on my obs on observations. I try to be as scientific as possible about what I derive my morality from. If Dr. Moore creates his own morality or moral code, does not this imply that everyone else has the equal right to create theirs? And since what is the case for Dr. Moore is the case for everyone else, why is he implicitly challenging the truthfulness of my moral code by coming to this debate? Further, what if it is moral on the parts of all Christians to see their moral obligation as worshiping the true and living God? Would Dr. Moore tell us we are wrong? Even further, given Dr. Moore's statement that we that, um, can he, excuse me, even further, given Dr. Moore's statement, can he justifiably state of Jeffrey Dahmer I doubt he was being sincere in his, what he was saying. The famous atheist Darwinian scientist Richard Dawkins stated, quote, the universe that we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. And yet he calls Yahweh evil. Dr. Moore stated, creationists, have a hard time accepting the view that reality doesn't care. They really need to have this conception that there really is a purpose. Evolutionary theory obviously undermines this. Amazingly, atheists of this sort assert a purpose when coming to debates. Genetic evolutionary atheism is not livable. For this reason, among others, it fails to be a plausible worldview. Well, you know, I've already lost the debate, so. You know. <laughs> um, Dr. Suclos, um, if I may proceed um, at your discretion, um, yes. Dr. Suclos actually commits uh, a fallacy of his own when he argues that because DNA doesn't have any intention, that I shouldn't have any intention. That's the fallacy of, of uh, assigning the parts to the whole, um, which is not the case. The, the DNA is not me. Um, so I can, I'm a living, thinking, conscious person, a uh, moral agent, and I, I can assign my own meaning, and I can um, come up with my own moral structures, my own way of looking at the world. But that's not really what's at debate tonight, whether or not I can. It's the question of whether or not Christianity is unique and true, and I thought we might get back to that. Um, 
uh, notice that uh, Dr. Zuglis didn't really try to dispute um, the, the verse in Isaiah, which says that God creates evil, and for good reason, because the, the word there that's used, some apologists do try to dispute it. They say, well, it doesn't really mean evil, it just means like natural disaster or calamity or something like that. The problem there is that the, the word that's used in the Hebrew is ra, and ra is very unequivocally evil. Um, in Genesis uh, 2, we have the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The evil there is ra. If ra means calamity or natural disaster, then we have a situation where Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and natural disasters, which doesn't really make much sense. Uh, we also have uh, the men of Sodom, the way that they are characterized in Genesis, they are, they are said to be evil, ra, evil. So if they are evil, then God is creating evil. Yahweh is creating evil. Um, Psalm 37, in fact, uh, uses the same word when, it's, when it uh, makes a difference between uh, turning your back on evil and doing good. So it's very clear Yahweh takes the credit for creating evil. That really does not appear to be the, 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 the true, infinitely perfect uh, deity that, that Christians uh, claim to worship. Um, and it, it goes further than that. I mean, it, it's really not just a, a problem for the Christian deity. Um, the, the question of the moral, where morality, how we can get morality from any deity actually goes back all the way to um, a fellow named Epicurus who posed this riddle. He said, is God willing to prevent evil but not able? Then he is not omnipotent. Of course, Christians think he is. Is he able but not willing? Then he is malevolent, which Christians don't think he is. Is he both able and willing? Well, then where does evil come from? Of course, the Bible says it comes from God. Is he neither able nor willing? Then why call him God? And this can be applied to any sort of theistic God concept, not just the Christian concept. Um, and there is no good answer for this. There, there's, there's never been a good answer for this. Um, the, the idea of a good deity, of, of, of morality coming from the deity, died here with, with Epicurus uh, back uh, when, um, uh, when the ancient Greeks considered this question. And it, it, we've just been sort of telling ourselves and, and, and sort of fooling ourselves in this. But if you look at the Bible, if you, especially in the Old Testament, you look and see what God asked people to do and what, what people were willing to do. God asked Abraham to sacrifice his own son, to kill his own son. I just had a son recently. I can tell you quite clearly, if anybody, I don't care who, what sort of a God asked me to kill my son, I would say no, and I would be justified in doing so. Thank you. We have time. You saw the time. Oh. Well, okay. All right, so we have time now for um, the affirmative conclusion of six minutes and the negative conclusion at six minutes as well. Um, if, while you're doing this, if you have time to write your questions down, um, if you want to pass them to the sides along the way. Make sure they write on there. All right, yeah, so if you could write it, Steve or Zach. And then um, we'll, I'll, I'll read the questions to Zach, and Randy will read the questions to Steve. Um, so it, actually, if um, I don't, I don't want to take away from the, uh, you're listening to the conclusion. So maybe I can give a few minutes. One of the unique things is, I'll just get the microphone for a second, because I know that the people online can't hear me otherwise, um, is that we've also invited folks to Twitter in their questions or on Facebook. So those online, uh, who are uh, who received the invitation to this, you can send those in via Facebook when that comes. So we'll have six minutes for the con conclusion statements from both groups. Uh, I'll give you a minute to write your questions after the conclusion. How about that? That makes sense. Yeah. If you have questions already written, uh, Terry will just wait. That was bad on my part. So, you ready? All right, begin. Babe swats homer. Does that mean Babe Ruth hit a home run or a baby slapped a gentleman named Homer? Words meaning come from the context. Ra in Hebrew can mean different things depending on the context, something about which Dr. Moore is not trained. Secondly, Epicurus, I will paraphrase the argument, a more popular form of that. I hope I address it, Dr. Moore. Evil exists. God is all-powerful. Evil still exists. God is able to destroy evil, but he doesn't. Therefore, God is evil or he doesn't exist. The other logical option, quite, quite frankly, I could add to Epicurus, I hope if I understood Dr. Moore right, is that evil exists. God is all-powerful. Evil still exists. God has not yet done with it. Right? That's, an op that's a, a logical option. 
In this, unique, unique, in this uniquely reliable book known as the New Testament, Jesus once asked, why do people, or who do people say the Son of Man is? Amazingly, billions of people, oh, one other thing. The debate is not whether the Bible is unique. The debate is whether or not the Bible is uniquely true. Dr. Moore's point in pointing out uh, comparative texts, he said it's just not unique, but that's not debate. The debate, the deba debate is, is it uniquely true? Amazingly, billions of people just can't leave this question alone. Neither can the famous atheist Richard Dawkins. Recall his statement, there is no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. In what follows, I demonstrate the profound inability of Richard Dawkins to live consistently within his atheistic worldview. Dawkins wrote an article entitled, entitled Atheists for Jesus. In it, Dawkins writes, with the purpose of impo I'll, I'll address that in a moment. Of, of imposing his beliefs on others as if his beliefs were universally true. But Dawkins should admit that if the universe has no purpose and he is part of the universe, his behaving with a purpose in a universe with no purpose is really an illusion. Further, why then even write such an article? Dawkins states that Jesus was a theist. With this, Dawkins admits to the existence of Jesus. Where did Dawkins receive the information for this? Apparently it was the Bible, and it apparently provided trustworthy empirical evidence for his statement that Jesus was a theist. Dawkins goes on, in the teachings that are attributed to him, we, uh, he publicly advocated niceness. Here Dawkins operates epistemologically as if the Bible provides some empirical evidence for his assertion. Second, note the phrase, in the teachings that are attributed to him. Here Dawkins enters the field of comparative textual studies, a science dealing with historical exist, uh, evidence. Third, what does Doc Dawkins mean by niceness on the part of Jesus? Zachary was just, Dr. Moore was just saying he's not nice. Yahweh's not nice. And Jesus is Yahweh, by the way, in the flesh. Was Jesus nice when he drove out the money changers in the temple? Was Jesus nice when he said that he would separate the sheep from the goats in eternal judgment? In a universe with no purpose, Dawkins purposefully rages on in judgment against those steeped in Sharia-like cruelties of Leviticus and Deuteronomy, to those brought up to fear the vindictive Ayatollah-like God of Abraham and Isaac. These kinds of people, say, says Dawkins, Jesus opposed. So they, quote, no wonder they nailed him. Apparently, this refers to the cross. Dawkins continues his rage. Religion motivates people to whip their own backs, to set fire to themselves or their daughters. Does not Dawkins know that Jesus' religion was one where Jesus willingly suffered a bloody, violent, and murderous death? And that this is recorded in the very New Testament where Dawkins finds his empirical information? Dawkins states that he thinks a reborn Jesus would wear the t-shirt reading, Atheists for Jesus, but that it, Jesus would turn it around to read Jesus for Atheists. <laughs> By reborn Jesus, Dawkins means Jesus being naturally born one more time. This, of course, is merely stated by him for effect. But there is something implicit here. Dawkins thinks Jesus is dead, dead and gone. Therefore, Dawkins rejects the bodily resurrection of Jesus, again a doctrine that is mentioned in the very Bible from which he gathers information. Atheists speaking of Jesus in such selective ways should think of the logical ramifications. First, this act of theirs places a selective stamp of approval on the reliability, to some sense, of the New Testament, at least portions of it. Second, with his use of the New Testament, Dawkins implicitly gives an empirical verifiability salute to portions of the New Testament. Christians should encourage atheists like Dawkins to continue to live inconsistently with, their world, with his worldview. This affords atheists the warranted opportunity to give empirical reasons why it is and how it is they come to accept some verses of the Bible but reject others. Now, Dr. Moore said, I create my own moral code. Once again, I will vis visit this. He has lost by being here. If he creates his own moral code, then so do I. And so do you. And therefore, my moral code is just as valid as he. But to come here to debate me that I'm wrong is a violation of his worldview. You cannot have it both ways. So again, 
He's lost the debate. Uh, with, with all due respect to Dr. Sukalis, um, if the Bible is not unique, then it can't be uniquely true. And I don't think we've heard a, a ref refutation of whether or not the Bible is unique tonight, so I, I guess I'll take that point conceded. Ten years ago, I never would have dreamed that I would be in a place like this, arguing against the truth of the Bible. But I realized, after examining it on its own merits, as a work of literature, that it did not represent the divine truth that I've been raised to believe in. Um, I asked myself the question, if I hadn't been raised as a Christian, and if instead I'd been given a Bible and then been asked to evaluate it as a divine work, yes or no, would I find it to be such? And instantly I knew that the answer was no. I didn't even really have to think about it. Um, and then that shocked and surprised me, actually. Because in that moment I realized all along that I had valued truth above all other things. And I'd worship the God of the Bible because I thought that he was the source of that truth. But if the Bible is not the work of God, well, then it doesn't, it's no fault of the Bible that it doesn't represent truth. It's just a human work, just like any other work of, li work of literature, just like the Quran, just like the Enuma Elish, just like the Lord of the Rings, even. What presents a problem is not the Bible. The Bible is a far easier book for me to understand now as an atheist. I don't have to ignore passages or bend over backwards to make one verse not contradict another one or try to make some claim to context. I don't have, I don't no longer have to make the Bible be something that it's not. I don't want to embarrass the Bible anymore by claiming that it's more than what it always was, just a work of human literature. The problem is in those who would hold the Bible to a standard that no book can be reasonably held to, that of being an infallible guide to any religious worldview. And that problem is compounded when people who place the Bible on a divine pedestal not only use it to rule their spiritual lives, but also use it to rule the rest of their lives and then try to use it to rule the lives of other people. The Bible screams in protest at this, but hardly anyone in the church seems to be listening. Is it any wonder then that the Christian church in America is bleeding members at a rate not seen before in recent memory? If ever, a new study released just last week by the Public Religion Research Institute at Georgetown University found that college-age millennials are abandoning their religious upbringing like no other generation before them. These young people are more likely than ever to be religiously unaffiliated as many as 25%, in fact. Less than a quarter of those still believe the Bible to be the literal word of God, and nearly 40% of these people agree with me. They agree with my assessment of the Bible, that it's a human work and nothing else. Actually, some people do kind of seem to be listening here in the DFW area. This is the land of megachurches, after all, and all you really have to do is to just to visit any one of these megachurches to find a place that doesn't take the Bible seriously at all. I've visited many of them recently. I, I, I enjoy going to them, I don't know why. Um, but I, I recently visited the Fellowship Church in Grapevine, um, and I went to the bookstore there to see what they had on the shelves. And it was very easy for me to find lots of books by their, ed, by their head pastor, Ed Young Jr., um, all 200 some titles that he's written in the past year or so, um, placed in the most prominent location possible in the bookstore, you know, surrounded by all these lights and fancy stuff. Um, it was very hard for me to find a Bible. I had to go all the way back to the back of the bookstore in the corner on a nondescript shelf to find a Bible there. Uh, there. There's no promotion of it at all. It seems to me that the Bible is the best-selling book that nobody actually reads. Now, there may be good reason for this. Isaac Asimov said that properly read, the Bible is the most potent force for atheism ever conceived. And I've certainly found that to be the case. I know many of the people in the Dallas Fort Worth Coalition of Reason have found that to be the case. This may be a, a terrifying proposition for those of you that are still Christians. And you may be thinking, I, I certainly don't want to read the Bible and become an atheist, so how can I still do it without, without noticing all these things that, that Zach has been talking about? Well, I'll tell you how. If you don't want to do what I've done, uh, there's very good news. All you have to do is zig where I've zagged. So pay close attention. When you read the Bible, Try not to pay much attention at all when it talks about uh, the Canaanite babies that were killed by the, by the Hebrew soldiers. Don't pay attention to that. Um, don't ever, ever, ever read the Gospels in parallel. Stick to um, reading bits and pieces, just one verse is out of context. Don't ever, ever um, compare different verses in the, in the different Gospels together. Um, you want to stay away completely from ancient mythology. Um, don't really try to learn anything about the Sumerian culture. Uh, stay away from the Ugaritic culture entirely. Uh, and certainly not the mystery cults of the Hellenistic world. Just, just uh, avoid those entirely. Um, if you can, read only those books that your pastor approves of. 
And uh, be sure to find uh, apologetic websites and other resources that will explain away all the, the jots and tittles of, of scripture uh, that troubles you. Tell yourself over and over again that it's better to have any explanation at all, even if it's ridiculous, as long as it uh, uh, doesn't contradict what you believe about Christianity. Um, and allow yourself only to have an open mind about things that don't threaten your worldview. And don't ever, 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 and I mean this, don't ever think about how easily a Muslim will see the mistakes in your Bible the same way that you see the mistakes in his Quran. If you can do all of that, then you can be a reasonably satisfied Christian in today's world and more power to you. If you can't, well then, again, here's my card. I'll talk to you later. Thank you. At this point, we'll take uh, some time to, if you want to write your questions down and hand those in. Um, and if you don't have a question, I don't know if you can get out to get any more pizza if there's there in the back, but y you're welcome to try. And um, we'll take a, a minute and we'll collect the questions and I'll look on Facebook and Twitter to see what people, how people have responded there. And then uh, we'll, we'll put that out. Is there a question? Oh, Steve. Yeah, so put Steve on the top of it if it's for Steve, or Zach on the top if it's for Zach. I'm not going to call any questions out. I'm going to read you each question. Oh, I see. Let you decide if you want to answer it or not, or how long it's going to take. That way I'm not filtering them. When I'm going to read them to both of us. I should get on that iPad. I'm not going to that. I haven't able to move the iPad yet myself. I know, I'm going to read, he's going to read the questions to Zach. I'm going to address the Zach as far as Can you type it right now? Here. I saw you writing down, too. Oh, there you go. I'm just going to read them as they If it's a valid question, let me try that with the iPad. I'm going to the iPad. Sorry. It's supposed to work, but I've never done it. Okay. Because I don't know what you should say. Someday, soon, maybe I'll get there. All right, let's see if I hold back questions. Biblical Center, Jackson, Mississippi. In Mississippi, uh -huh. did you fly in? Hmm? Did you fly or drive? Okay. Okay. Straight on 20. Okay. okay. So how, how I got one. At least I got one. That's good. Well, My thanks to Javier Montenegro from Chicago. Okay, that's not bad. I drive down to South Carolina. That's fine. Uh, it will be on there, so hopefully I can pull it off, too. Is that, if uh -huh. you want to use it. Right. I mean, if you like to. Is the rest online someplace where I can watch it? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, I sent it to you, <laughs> I think. I think I sent it to you on Thursday or Friday. It's like uh, the Ustream. The Ustream. I will just get it. <laughs> well, I wonder, because he didn't get, get that one email. We are having some trouble. Um, huh? See if anybody's hit me up yet. Okay, nobody on Twitter. Hey, Todd. Ten bucks, I'll put you Okay, can we collect the questions and bring them forward, please? You're good. No one's going to argue with you. I'm not sure how you can do You're not, are you?
So here we go. Everybody ready for the, and what we're going to do for this time is we'll have two minutes for, for, e for each person to respond to the question. So, Randy, thank you. Thank you, Andy. First question is for Steve. Why no mention of Herod's decree by any, including Jewish scholars, in Jesus' time? You want me to repeat that? Why no mention of Herod's decree by any, including Jewish scholars, in Jesus' time? Let me read the rest of it. Maybe it'll clarify that let me, some. Let me first respond quickly, if you don't mind. You can take the time off, obviously. The absence of evidence is not necessarily evidence of absence. The rest of the question is, why make claims counter to the actual evidence, e.g., claim of first century scrap of John versus from second century claims of eyewitness and contemporary authors in uh, parentheses none such as fraud of Josephus a well-known forger context of Greek poem I have no idea I'm sorry I can't I, I don't know what the Let's question is I don't either. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I took three seconds. You want to? I'll take one, and then you want to look through to see which one you like from <laughs> there. Then Can we do that? <laughs> okay. So, um, I guess I'll just hand the mic back for you. This comes from Javier Montenegro from Chicago. Um, says, "Question for Dr. Moore: Is it possible to say without any doubt that there is no God? Wouldn't that mean that one must have knowledge of everything in the universe?" Uh, no, not necessarily. If uh, It depends on what kind of God you're talking about, though. I mean, um, if you're talking about a God that has contradictory characteristics, for example, a God that is all good and also all evil, that, that's a contradiction. That cannot exist. So that kind of a God cannot exist. Um, is, it, is it possible to preclude the idea of any God that exists that you could I possibly imagine, logically? Um, I, I don't think so. I think that there there may be some sort of a god, but um, whether whether it's the Christian god, I'm pretty confident that that's not the one. So, question for Steve. All right, I don't know if they'll go all the way. Steve, this one is a little more straightforward, and it is clear. <laughs> Anything that supports the flood outside of the Bible. That's, a, that's an involved, uh, the, the, the answer is involved. Dr. Moore brought up similarities, and I mentioned the logical, con a logical conclusion from, from that would be uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that one of, uh, both of them are wrong, uh, but it can mean that one is still uniquely true. Since I am a biblical scholar uh, and a theologian, the Bible teaches of what is called a theodicy. And so, what was the question again? The flood. The flood. Is there any evidence the flood. The flood. Yes, there, there's evidence for the fl for a flood outside the biblical story. Doctor Moore mentioned some, but again, that doesn't mean the Bible is not uniquely true. It me it means it's not unique in its listing of a flood account, but it does not mean it's not uniquely true. So there are differences between Enuma Elish and Genesis one obvious differences and so uh, it could be that Genesis 1 is an apologetic against Enuma Elish that's a logical inference that I make and so therefore by comparative textual studies that Dr. Moore has done it does not therefore provide on his part a defeater logically for the view that the Bible is uniquely true. All right, thank you all for, I know this, this period's probably easier to wanna make, make comments, particularly because you're the one who asked the questions. So I understand that, um, but if we could still, um, you're, you're doing well, so thank you. Um, here's a question uh, for Zach. Do you believe in the gods mentioned in your first response or just used as evidence for your speech? Explain. Um, the gods like uh, Apsu and Tiamat, no, I don't believe in those gods. What, what, what I was using those for was to provide an argument uh, to say that uh, is 
you know, if, if Genesis 1 is similar to these other stories told about these other gods, um, then we have a, what I th would think would be a defeater against the idea that Christianity, biblical Christianity, is, u is uniquely true. If you find a similar story, even if it's an apologetic, it's still a similar story, uh, then we can't say that it's unique. We can't say that there's nothing else th out there like it. So, no, I, I don't believe in those, those gods either. Get, not, not taking all 30 seconds. It's, uh, all two minutes. It's great. Um, so that means we get to more questions. You proposed that the Bible books were historically reliable because they had the same accounts of numerous events. If this is true, how come the multiple accounts of Easter and the resurrection do in fact not align? To the questioner, you have to give me specific examples. A contradiction for one resurrection account uh, that says uh, angels appeared and another account that would say an angel appeared is not necessarily logically a contradiction. A contradiction would be, if I, I hope I'm getting at this person's question, a contradiction would be uh, two angels appeared and the other account only one angel appeared. That's a contradiction. All right, the next question um, is for both speakers. I think it's, it's very easy to read and it was even signed by the name. I won't give the name necessarily, but to both speakers, and we'll give Zach a chance to answer this first. Many, like myself, have been witness to hundreds of debates. We've heard virtually every argument and we hope to hear something new. Is there anything that either debater would like to say that they feel they rarely get a chance to say because the chance never comes up? And that's from somebody named Jason. Well, I, I, yeah, I guess I could. Um, uh, one, other, one thing that I wanted to bring up, I just didn't have time. Actually, it was relevant to the, the previous question of, of the, uh, the different accounts of Easter morning and the resurrection. One of the things that um, not many people really seem to realize is when you compare all the gospel accounts, that uh, there's actually no way of determining what the final words of Jesus on the cross were. And you would think that that would be a pretty obvious, I mean, that's the moment of history when all eyes are on Jesus and everybody's looking at what's happening, right? You think that there, there shouldn't be any disagreement there. But if you look at Matthew and Mark, they say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If you look at Luke, um, says something different and John says something different there. So why, you can't really determine what the final words of Jesus were. And to me, that seems like such a odd thing for, for uh, uh, these accounts that are supposed to correspond with each other. <coughs> All right, Dr. Sukalis, you have uh, two minutes. Again, not necessarily true, logically speaking. Uh, there's nothing in the text that says these are the last words of Jesus. Secondly, what I would like to add that's different to the ba debates that you've heard, questioner, is this. I bet you've never heard this in a debate. Hi, kids. I'm Bob the Tomato. <laughs> and I'm Larry the Cucumber. <laughs> and I'm Pa Great. Oi! And I'm Mr. Neza. No, there's nothing really new I can add except that. <laughs> okay. All right. You got a, got a question here? Yep. Steve, I am an atheist and a person you claim I cannot be. Oh, let me start over. I am an atheist and a moral person. You claim I cannot be. If your definition of morality differs from mine, explain why yours is better. I think I'm fine. Mine is better because, because the fount of my morality can be traced to ontology that is the triune God. I uh, don't know the specific brand of this person's uh, atheism. I would have to question her or him on some preliminary worldview accounts. Uh, questions. Um, but if you are an atheist, once again, like Dr. Moore, who stated, I create my own moral code. That implies that I have the right to do so, and so do all of you. And they are all inferentially on an equal playing field. Now, if he creates, if Dr. Moore, excuse me, if my mother always said, don't speak in the third person about people. If Dr. Moore, uh, speak personally in the third person. If Dr. Moore has stated I create my own morality, then is it not logically possible 
that the God of the Old Testament can also create his own? And he has no warrant to therefore criticize the God of the Old Testament. And secondly, again, it's my morality that Christian theism is uniquely true. Let's play on Dr. Moore's playing field. I created that. Equal playing field. I have that right to hold it. And if he creates his own, excuse me, Dr. Moore creates his own morality, and we both have an equal right to hold it, he cannot criticize mine for being wrong. Again, he's logically lost the debate by showing up. Okay, question for Zach. Um, and, and by the way, folks online, you still have a chance to send in a Facebook question, and you also um, have a chance. Nobody's sent, a, sent in a Twitter question. So, Captain Andy, I, 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 Twitter, um, I will send you something. I don't know, not money, but I'll send you, every, everybody here will get a chocolate when they leave. So <laughs> I'll send you a chocolate if you Twitter in a question. All right, so Zach, your question. Um, where do you think you are going when you die? I think I'm going the exact same place I was before I was born. You don't want to expound anymore? That was <laughs> That's all I know. Okay. <laughs> is, Yah is Yahweh omnipotent, but just too tragically slow, in other words, to save countless children from painful death in the arms of their earnest praying parents throughout history. Logically speaking, you are imposing, questioner, a moral paradigm upon Yahweh in which you expect him to act as you want him to act. That's your first presupposition that does not logically necessarily follow in the, in the discussion. Secondly, let's suppose that Yahweh does not heal everybody. I would like an atheist here, hypothetically, to make the declaration to wipe out all evil, if indeed that's logically consistent with her or his worldview to even think that. Make the decree. All evil is gone. You have just effectively wiped out the whole human race because to wipe out evil is to wipe it out not only as an actual but as a potential. Also, if he were to wipe out all evil and we impose this moral paradigm upon God, every time Dr. Moore goes to type his atheist sentence against Yahweh, God will burn his hands. But then Dr. Moore would say, well, that's not fair, that's not loving. Lastly, who is to say logically who is to say that it is necessarily the case that God is evil because he allow, allows young people or whomever to die? How do you know that it might have been better for these people in the future? Can you tell me absolutely that it would have been better for these people in the future? And then probably, finally, finally, if you're an atheist, you can't ask the question because why, if you are a materialistic atheist, is not in your vocabulary? How might be, but the why questions, as Richard Dawkins um, represented one of his friends, Peter Atkins, the why question is just a silly question. Uh, I, since a direct uh, was referring to Zach, I'll give Zach a chance to have a 30 second response. We might do this. Um, we have What's that? Oh, great, okay. But I'll give, if somebody could bring that around, so I'll give 30 seconds. I will stay, say, state unequivocally, uh, categorically, that if I had it in my power, I would get rid of all evil, just like that. Um, if anybody's worried that I would wipe out the human race by doing that, then I might, you know, dial it back, find a compromise. Let's just wipe out all cancer, like that. Uh, would that be a problem? Let's, let's, let's make all the guns in the world not work anymore. Would that be a problem? Uh, let's get rid of heart disease. Would that be a problem? Diabetes, would that be a problem? Uh, it doesn't seem like a problem to me. Okay, for Zach. And, um, yeah. Can you expound on your views of human origin based on your studies? 
Uh, yeah, well, uh, so science uh, shows that the humans, what we, what we think of as a human species, uh, speciated somewhere between 100,000 and 200,000 years ago, um, most likely in Central Eastern Africa. Um, yes, as, as Randy is showing, we are all Africans uh, in, in, our, in our lineage, um, and that our, our species, our ancestors, moved out of Africa and uh, into Europe and, and east into uh, and Asia. It's, it's, it's not a very controversial thing. Um, you know, all genetic evidence shows that, that we're all related to each other. Um, I'm related to every single person in this room. People that have blue eyes, in fact, are closely, more closely related to me than, than other people in this room uh, because uh, the mutation occurred only once in, in human history that we can tell. Um, so we, we came from a, a population that was um, pri primates, so we're, we are primates uh, as animals. And uh, at some point, we, our ancestors looked something very similar to what the chimpanzee's ancestors looked like. If that's kind of what you're going for, then yes, we, we did evolve from, from a primate uh, population. Steve, would you like a response to that? 30, 30 first, seconds. first, all the more reason not to judge on a moral code. And secondly, uh, not being a specialist in Dr. Moore's field, read widely, as I am doing right now in fields other than my own. Read widely. Michael Behe, uh, in Intelligent Design. Uh, Dr. Moore, visit his website. Read widely. Do Google searches. Research scholarly articles. Uh, excuse me. That's all the time we have. Yeah, well, since they brought up the websites, they both have websites are connected with. Um, so it's, is it doctorsact.com? Uh, actually, dfwcor.org if you want. Yes. DFWCOR.org if you want to um, find out more about the Coalition of Reason and uh, f find out what we're doing. We do a heck of a lot in, in the community now, so we're, we're growing and we're getting more active. And uh, Steve, you want to mention your website? Sure. You can uh, read about me and some of my published works at WBS, that's for Wesley Biblical Seminary, WBS.edu, click faculty, read a little bit about me, or go to my parachurch ministry, Sound Doctrine Ministries, which is S D. M-I-N dot com, S as in sound, D as in doctrine, M-I-N short for ministry, S-D-M-I-N dot com. Okay. Your, your time. I need the extra you know, it's funny. He has his uniform on and I have mine on. Is that nice? <laughs> yeah, sure. Steve, you cited several sources from the second century C.E., it is generally accepted by scholars that if Jesus would, was real, he would have had to have been crucified around 33 CE. How then could these sources be evidence for anything other than the existence of Christians, given they occur over 70 years after the supposed death of Jesus? Read that again, please. All of it? Just the how can portion. How can these? I'm looking for it. Okay. Given, given, that, uh, given they occur over 70 years after the supposed death of Jesus. Okay, start with the how. I found the how. How then could these sources be evidence for anything other than the existence of Christians given they occur 70 years after the supposed death of Jesus? Uh, not sure, I'm not sure I understand that, but uh, scholars have dated, for example, uh, Galatians and Thessalonians to around the 40s A.D., and 50s AD. The Gospel of Mark may be dated as early as 60 AD. Uh, so they were well within range for people to say, no! Uh, but there are no historical records of that sort existing to counter these, these claims. Uh, okay. okay. I'm looking for any other Twitter or... Um, here we go. Oh, there's a Ustream question. Okay. For Dr. Moore, I didn't even know we could ask you questions on Ustream. Do people do that in my sermons? Okay. Uh, so, Dr. Moore, what is your reasonable objective foundation for your morality? I'll repeat it. Dr. Moore, what is your reasonable objective foundation for your morality? Well, I don't, I don't think that we need objective foundations for morality. I think that... Um, the experiences that we have indicate that, um, to a large degree, morality is relative to the situation. I'll give you an example. 
Um, so one of the things that the Ten Commandments say, or at least one version of the Ten Commandments, is that you should not lie. You should not bear false testimony. Um, and that's generally something that we think is basically true. It's bad to lie, right? Now, is, that, is there an objective, clear, absolute foundation for that? Well, but we can, cons we can come up with some situations where it might actually be a very good idea to lie. For example, if you're at your house and a woman comes banging on your door and she, you open up the door and she's bruised and bloody and she, her teeth are broken and she says, my husband has been beating me and he's chasing me and if he finds me, he's going to kill me. Will you please hide me from him? You let, him, you let her into your house and the husband comes and a few minutes later banging on your door and says, did my wife come in here? If you're a moral person, you absolutely lie to him. And lying to him is the right thing to do in that, in that point. So when we talk about objective morality, I, it's, it's sort of, I mean, it's, it's kind of a gray area. It, it kind of operates most of the time as their objectively moral things. But we have to realize that there's a situational relativism at work. And no moral system can work unless it takes that into account. Steve, there's two questions on here, but I can't read the second one, so I'll just read the first one. How do you reconcile the idea that a good God can order his followers to exterminate people and to rape their virgin daughters? We are not as innocent as we think. Take into account, please, a theodicy, what is known as a theodicy, which means the rule of God uh, in the midst of the rule of God in God's existence in everyday affairs, I should say. I'm just escaping me for now how to define that. Excuse me. The Odyssey. We are not as innocent as we think. Adam and Eve created. What happens in the garden? They blow it. The serpent, who's a symbol of evil or, quite possibly, Satan himself, misleads. Adam and Eve choose, because God is a loving God, giving them freedom of choice. They choose to rebel against the first legion of Genesis 1 and 2. They are banished. Now don't, and, but before they are banished, they are covered, typifying the coming of Christ to cover sins. Animal sacrifice. Now, don't you think Adam and Eve should therefore have told the story and told it well? to their descendants. I, have, I infer this, of course. But nonetheless, we have an increasing evil in the world to the point where Yahweh wipes out everything save eight people, Noah and his family. Now, don't we think Noah should have told the story and told it well? But no, we run into more religious, uh, contrary to the first religion and religion, uh, contrary to this, we blow it over and over and over again to the point where, because Yahweh is love and gives us free will, we choose to rebel against him. Now, who's to say logically that killing is not for a reason other than what we might know it is? And again, final point, atheist, uh, materialistic, genetic, evolutionary type, again, can't make this moral judgment. Time. Stop it. Live consistent with your worldview. You want 30 seconds, Zach? Is that, or, is that? Um, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> when it comes to the, the murder of these young, young, young people, young girls, and, or the rape of the young girls, I find it very hard, um, I, maybe Dr. Tsoukalos is, is better able to, but I, I find it very hard, I sort of picture them, I picture the, a young girl, you know, 10 years old or so, um, beaten up, sexually abused, and she's looking at me, and I'm trying to explain to her that this is all for your good. This is because you deserve this, because of what Eve did. And I find it impossible to, to be able to do that to a girl. Rejoinder, do you want to respond, Dr. Scouts? Another 30 seconds, Dr. Sakalis. Says who? Okay. Um, all right, so we'll go to, I, I do have a question from Twitter. Thank you. Um, maybe somebody in the room did that. I don't know. I guess that, it doesn't have to come online. So this comes from James Malone, um, Dr. Moore. And it's, we'll have two more questions. Um, 
how can you claim the Enuma Elish is the same as the Genesis narrative when Genesis, Genesis is clearly monotheistic? Let me repeat. Sure. Well, I didn't claim it was the same. I said it was ve very similar, it cu cut from the same cloth. So it'd be kind of like saying, um, you know, a, a Big Mac is kind of the same as a Whopper. It doesn't maybe doesn't have the same special sauce, but they're both hamburgers. They both have the same basic ingredients. They may be put together differently, um, but they're they're basically being used for the same purpose. So yeah, Genesis is very different because that culture, when that was written, when those when those myths were brought together, they became monotheistic. But um, if you go through the, the scriptures and you, you check, you see that actually the, the ancient Israelites were not monotheistic all the time. In fact, um, for a great period of time, there was actually the worship of a wife of Yahweh, and her name is Asherah. And this is actually in the Bible. If you, if you go through the Bible and you count up all the years that Asherah was worshipped in the temple along with Yahweh, it's actually two-thirds of the time that there was a temple. So the majority of the time that a temple existed that Hebrews were worshipping there, Yahweh had a wife. So they were not as monotheistic as you might think. Since we have some time, Steve, would you like to respond to that for 30 seconds? Again, read widely. Um, from what I understand from the scholar who lives with me, that's not necessarily the case. And the archaeological finds supposedly uh, associated with it might not conclusively prove what Dr. Moore uh, just stated. So again, let's all read wisely. Let's, let's be like Michael Behe, uh, who encourages us to read widely when we look at uh, genetic evolution and intelligent divine, um, excuse me, Pat. design and the scriptures. Let's, let's put it together gotcha. widely. Okay. I, I was just reading from the Bible. That's where the Asherah comes from. Okay. Um, we have uh, one more question for Steve, then I'll have one more question for Zach. Steve, I would like to know why Steve took this debate as a personal attack and spoke about being attacked instead of debating the topic at hand. I don't recall I took it as a personal attack. Did, uh, it, if I did, that's good. If I did, that's good. I'm just saying that Dr. Moore has no ontological universal standardization for attacking the view of Christian theism. Read the question again, please, so I can refine. Okay. Um, I would like to know why Steve took this debate as a personal attack and spoke about being attacked instead of debating the topic at hand. Again, I don't recall stating I'm being attacked, um, but if I w if, if I thought I'm being attacked, that's, that's cool with me. All right, last question for Zach. How can an atheist look at the beauty of the world around him or her in nature, mountains, flowers, animals, humans, and believe that it was all so intricately formed by accident? Can you repeat that? I didn't read it very well. Okay. My response would be, how can you not? Um, it's just the, the entire world, when you, when you look at the systems that are in place that, that govern the, the, the motions of the planets, that, that govern our genetics, and you, you really understand those from a naturalistic perspective, um, miracle isn't even, isn't, isn't even a big enough word to, to describe what the universe really is to me. Um, it is overwhelming just looking up into the stars um, and realizing, and, and this is true, that the only way that the atoms that form our bodies could ever come and be formed on Earth is through in the, in the center of a supernova, in the center of a massive star, and that star had to blow up and shoot its particles across the cosmos, and they, would, they had to condense on our planet and, um, and become part of the crust and then be taken up into our bodies. And to realize, when you look up at the stars, you're looking up at the source of you, the place where your atoms come from, because we are all made of stars. We are all stardust. And I can feel the hair on the back of my neck rising, even as I'm thinking about it. It's just so amazing. Um, and it's, it's almost um, 
spiritual isn't isn't a, a good enough word that I think that's the only word that we have because that's that's what we've been saddled with for so long but I really experience um, an amazing uh, in, uh, enthralling naturalistic spirituality um, anytime I go into nature I don't need uh, having a God there um, w would almost mess it up it would uh, you know because then it, then it brings up the imperfections and you have to ask well why do we have appendixes and and why do men have nipples and things like that and then then it gets complicated and, and you know nasty and, and gross but if it's if it's a non-cause process then it's beautiful and that's the only way it can be beautiful thank you well I've been to many debates and um, and I'm thankful that we had s s spirited debaters I like to give you an opportunity you have been patiently waiting to give these gentlemen a hand Well, we appreciate your time and coming out tonight. And because it's hosted by the Salvation Army, um, I'd like to just invite anybody to come and participate in any activities of the Salvation Army. Um, we are a church. Our mission is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and meet human needs in his name without discrimination. You can come in and visit us on Ustream. We have our services, our Sunday school and Bible studies at 10 o'clock on Sunday. And 11 o'clock is what we call our holiness meeting, our our worship service so you're invited to that you're also invited to come and help us I know Randy and I have already had con helpful conversations about the potential of working together on other projects that we do we have in this facility um, a family shelter for 15 families who are transitioning to towards stability we also have after-school programs creative arts programs many other things happening so we welcome you to participate in the Salvation Army thank you all for coming tonight and God bless you and I, I say that oh wait, one more what about oh yes 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 thank you um, so tomorrow, uh, there's several UTA students here. Tomorrow, at our free lunch that we offer every Monday at noon, uh, we're going to uh, Dr. Sue Callis will be here for that, and particularly addressing issues related to Buddhism. And uh, we have several students who come from that background, from China and elsewhere. So everybody's invited. To that I we'll figure out a way to feed everybody. But you're invited for another free lunch if you'd like to come tomorrow at noon and um, engage Dr. Sue Callis at that time. Zach, you're invited too. Yeah. All right. Have a good night. God bless you.